Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome back to Top Med Talk here at Anesthesiology 2023. It's the annual meeting of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host. I'm joined by my co-host and the new co-editor-in-chief of Top Med Talk, Mike Grocott. Hi, Mike. Hi, Desiree. We've had a lot of focus on artificial intelligence, technology, emerging technology. Um, so I think that's kind of the buzzword this yeah, I'm, year. I'm word cloud, I'm word cloud's <laughs> normally anesthesiology and peri- perioperative peri- medicine. Peri- and this year it's just a massive AI. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, we did want to say, uh, before we get started in this conversation, a big thank you to the American Society of Anesthesiology for supporting us to be here this year. This booth is absolutely amazing. Um, and we couldn't do it without you. And also the support of all of our sponsors, GE Healthcare, uh, Medtronic, and especially our, our, one of our founding sponsors, Edwards Life Sciences. So thank you to all of them. Now, this next conversation is a little bit of a continuation of some of the, some of the ones we've had here on Top Med Talk earlier in the year. It's actually really exciting for me. So I don't know, for many of you out there may not know, I wear another hat, <laughs> not just Top Med Talk, but I'm also Vice President of Clinical Quality for North Star Anesthesia. And so it is a privilege to be sitting down with my colleagues here from North Star. Adam Spiegel, our CEO. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah. And Josh Lemley, my uh, partner in crime. Yeah. <laughs> when it we comes like, to quality. We, yeah. Desiree and I are like Voltron. <laughs> it's like come together and create Uber, Uber <laughs> anesthesia quality. That's right. He's our chief quality officer. Gentlemen, thank you so much for sitting yeah. down with us. Um, before we get started, I thought it would be good just to give a little bit of background information. So Adam, I know we've we've talked about this before on Top Med Talk, but for those who may not have listened, tell us just a little bit about your uh, background, where you come from your experience in anesthesia? I've been in healthcare for about 25 years. I started working with a company called the Advisory Board, which does sort of research and consulting, uh, as well as uh, technology for hospitals and health systems. We were acquired by Optum. I then worked at Optum, partially with their Optum Care Group, which you know manages physician practices. I think that gave me some exposure to getting closer to the patient, which I really mm-hmm. enjoyed, and had the opportunity to come over and uh, work at Northstar. So um, moved over in 2018 and have been a CEO since. Yeah, fantastic. And Josh, your background? So I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, my first job out of residency, did residency at the Brigham, was at Ohio State. So I was the director of uh, the cancer hospital there, was teacher of the year, uh, was very much on the academic line. Actually, 10 years ago here oh, yeah. and in uh, San Francisco, uh, a colleague of mine introduced me to um, uh, w- uh, one of the executives at North Star at the time and sort of, mm. I wasn't super happy with the cur- career trajectory in academic medicine and uh, a door opened at North Star and I've been w- with the company since then. So it was clinical operations and then recently in 2019 transitioned into the quality space as CQO. Yeah, fantastic. Well, you know, we do have a, li- a lot of listeners that are not from the U.S. and don't really understand how anesthesia management works. And, um, you know, a lot of questions that I get is, oh, aren't you working for the hospital or you're working for the system? And that's not really kind of how it works <laughs> here. So, Adam, I thought um, we kind of start off with maybe you giving like really high level overview of what it looks like in the U.S. when it comes to to team anesthesia and management of um, that service within a hospital. Yeah. Yeah, and so the way to think about it is um, largely anesthesia outside of ap- academic medical centers is run by private practices. Mm-hmm. So the practices come in and they provide the staffing for surgical departments uh, to do anesthesia. Um, that is, you know, we tend to take a team based approach to anesthesia care. So it involves both physicians and CRNAs. We employ the physicians and CRNAs and we work to contract with the hospital to cover a certain number of ORs and um, uh, norocytes per day for certain time periods. So we may, you know, have 10 sites uh, between, you know, seven and three, and that may come down to five and then three overnight kind of thing. So we actually provide that service. um, And, you know, different anesthesia companies are focused on different areas. I think in general, North Star has really grown organically, which is, when hospitals are either having trouble staffing certain sites or individual groups may say, hey, I'm pulling out of a market and there's a space where the hospital needs to find anesthesia care, we get a call and we go in and provide those services. 
Yeah. And, you know, right now it's a, a little bit of a tough market in the U.S., I think. Can you kind of go over some of the headwinds that the NSC, you know, why would a particular small group be calling us for the help? What is it about, you know, what they've been operating in the last 20 years and doing fine? All of a sudden they're not. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think a lot of countries around the world are having this issue where there's just not enough anesthesia providers yep. uh, for the amount of surgical capacity that they need. That issue has been exacerbated in the U.S. And it's largely because um, the amount of surgical capacity isn't regulated in any way. And if you think about an average hospital, they're getting 20 percent of the work that they do is through surgery, but it's 80 percent of their profits. So hospitals see volume as the way that they actually can survive. During COVID, you had this issue where um, hospitals were not allowed to do elective procedures. Mm -hmm. And as a result, more and more elective procedures are being done in ambulatory surgery centers. And if you take the average orthopedic surgeon as an example, um, they may have done total knees and total hips in a hospital setting because they were concerned about quality. They were concerned about, hey, what if this goes sideways? I don't feel very comfortable doing it in an ambulatory site. And during COVID, they had no choice because if they wanted to actually see their patients, they either weren't going to see the patients or they were going to do them in ASC. And what happened? Well, the case started on time. Uh, my patient was able to find parking very easily and they showed up and they were, we're very happy, happy with uh, the outcomes and they went home and they were healthy and everything went great. Well, why in the world would I go back to starting doing these cases in a hospital? Well, the hospitals say, oh, well, of course, all these people are going to bring their volume back. So I'm going to run the same number of rooms. In fact, I'm going to run even more because I'm sure there's a lot of latent demand out there. So I need to staff my rooms. I need to make sure I'm providing lots and lots of time. Well, the ASCs have seen this influx of volume. So they're now saying, I need to run these rooms later. I need to open up on weekends to accommodate the volume that I'm seeing. So what ended up happening is over the last couple of years, you've had this dramatic growth in capacity, but the volume hasn't been there. So for an anesthesia group, we're being contracted to run more rooms, but the volume's the same as it was previously. So we have very expensive resources that are very hard to find sitting in rooms that aren't actually being used. And that creates a very tough economic environment. So that's sort of the big piece, which was because of this demand expansion, there aren't enough anesthesia providers. That's driven up costs by about 30%, anesthesiologists and CRNAs. The second component of it is reimbursement. So in the States, you get paid by commercial payers and by the government. Medicare has been reducing rates to pay to anesthesia consistently by about 2% per year over the last few years. Commercial payers, because of the No Surprises Act, yeah. uh, have actually also been reducing what they've largely been paying to anesthesia providers. So costs have gone up, revenue's gone down, um, and yet uh, it's not a normal supply and demand world. So what ends up happening for anesthesia groups is they're getting squeezed on those sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm really interested. As you know, you three are really familiar with this world, and for me, it, <laughs> it's, it's much less familiar. Can you give me a feel for um, sort of the size of North Star, the number of different similar organizations there are, the scale of them, when, and what proportion of the overall anesthesia provider market that is? For the large national players, so uh, North Star, we work in about 220 sites uh, across multiple states, so 19, 20 states. Um, the national players are probably about 15% of the overall anesthesia market. I would say close to 85% of overall volume is outsourced. So a private practice is serving that. And again, of which the overall, you know, we're probably 15 or 20% are national players. And there's four or five groups that really are at a national scale that make that up. Um, the other 15% are academic medical centers, largely who tend to employ their own anesthesiologists. Yeah. And, and how many providers do you have within the organization? So we have probably close to 4,000 providers across physicians and uh, nurse anesthetists. And there's a, there's a few other similar Yeah, companies. so there's probably four or five that are kind of of size. Yeah. And then you also have some regional players that are, you know, call it a third the size of what we would say. It's probably another, you know, six to ten of them. Yeah, okay. and <clears throat> the only other color I'll just offer for the clinicians that are not U.S.-based. So this ranges the gamut, you know, everywhere from small community hospitals that'll do a couple hundred deliveries a year and, you know, bread and butter ENT, you know, healthy GYN, GU, general surgery cases, 
all the way to ambulatory surgery centers that'll be doing, you know, same day total joints, lots of orthopedics, lots of plastics, to large academic medical centers, level one traumas that are doing, you know, uh, transplants. Brain, brain yes, big, yes yeah. exactly. Complex spine, 5,000 deliveries a year, very complex procedures with an academic training component with residency program, et cetera. Yeah. Everything in between. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Do a little bit of everything. So one of the things that I wanted to go over too was, you know, when it comes to a large anesthesia management company, there are benefits that we can, you know, kind of have scale. What are some of those things that you think that North Star provides and, and can do that because of our size? In general has been kind of two approaches to leveraging sort of national scale and scope. One has been price, which I think there's been a lot in the news lately, which is, hey, if I could bring a bunch of large groups together, then I can actually stand on equal fitting, footing with some payers. So that way, what I, my focus is really going to be on how can we bring people together and really try to get more revenue for the work that we're doing. And we can do that because, you know, hey, a United Healthcare can say, well, I'm going to kick you out of network. Well, if I have enough scope, they can't do that. So they're going to have to keep me in network. And so that, that actually is not North Star, but there are certainly anesthesia companies who do that. The other side of the equation where North Star is largely sat is how do you leverage expertise in sort of surgical throughput operations in terms of working with hospitals to kind of right size their operation? And that's where, you know, at scale, we have the ability to find people who are really good at that. The other thing is, as we talked about, especially in some rural areas, very hard to recruit. Mm -hmm. And so you really need to have a national footprint to bring people in and they may rotate into a rural site for a little while while they want to maximize compensation and then they'll move somewhere else. And you need an ability to constantly backfill those people. Um, so having a national footprint scale, et cetera, it gives us an ability to staff a lot of those sites that are very hard to find people who are willing to go out there and do that. So if I understand you correctly, but if I think of my context within the National Health Service, we have an anesthetic department that looks after giving the anesthetics, but also the training, the quality, all that. and, and you're, you offer institutions that whole package. That's right. right. That's right. And you know, the other thing, just from a scale standpoint, is as an organization, if an anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, AA comes into us, you know, we have a like buffet of options. Do <laughs> you, you, you like doing heads? Do you like doing hearts? Okay, well, I've got a great location for you to work at. Do you, you want to work in a care team with a nurse anesthetist um, at a community hospital where you know the patients and you can see the people you work with at the grocery store, et cetera? We have locations that can facilitate that. Just one other point to the kind of operations point that Adam made is that, you know, we track a ton of metrics. And so, you know, based on those metrics, we can have some sort of scale of goodness of how we are performing, which also helps us scale going forward so that, you know, from a recruiting standpoint and from a retention standpoint amongst our employees, we can say like, you know, on this metric, your department is doing really well, or this hospital is doing extremely well. This department of anesthesia is, this would be a great place for you to join as a junior attending. Um, to kind of uh, step into a department that is functioning at a high level where you can kind of learn your craft and become a, 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 a well-functioning anesthesiologist fresh out of residency. And if you don't mind me asking, the, the compensation, do you have sort of performance-related package? Do you use incentives to, to persuade people to go to places they might not otherwise have to go? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I always say anesthesia is sort of the uh, anti, uh, like, every other job. So you know, you end up making the least amount of money in, in the big cities. <laughs> in the best so places. Cost, cost of living is really high and you make the least amount of money. Whereas if you're willing to go out to Lubbock, Texas, you make <laughs> a lot of money as an anesthesiologist. <laughs> and that's why, because obviously people, you know, will go where they want to go. So you do have different compensation based on where they're uh, living. There's also going to be an acuity and lifestyle perspective as well at certain facilities you know, that group is used to, hey, we're, we're willing to take a lot of call, but we want to be compensated for it. Yep. There are others that are much more lifestyle positions. And I think that's a little bit of where Josh was going, which is because we have a national footprint, there's a clinical side of it, which is, hey, these are the types of cases I want to do. Mm -hmm. There's also a lifestyle side of it, which is this is the amount of time I want to work. Am I in a period of my life where I want to pay off loans and do really well? Yeah. Or Am I at the point where, hey, I want to be able to step back a little bit, maybe work 80%, maybe work 50%. We have those types of roles for you. So I think that gives us an ability to 
follow somebody across an entire life cycle where they're out of school, they're going through family stuff, they're ready to ramp back up, and maybe they ramp back down and you know, it gives them a, play, a home that they can kind of do that across time. Yeah, and one of the areas of friction in terms of staffing departments of anesthesiology is, you know, historically it has always been, you know, I need 14 anesthesiologists and every four, all 14 of them need to be completely 100% interchangeable. And that, and that reality uh, really never existed, but it certainly does not exist post-COVID. Um, and, and so, um, you know, scale allows you, you know, first off, we are not in a market where we can say, yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry, I don't have a position for you only wanting to work as a point eight, point eight FTE. The reality is you have to say, we will make this work. We'll figure out a way, um, to operate scale enables that is, is to work with the requests of colleague anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists. Yeah. And, and the quality, you know, obviously you does really have quality is a key part of your roles. Is there any uh, compensation link to quality metrics? There is. Um, so we have it built in with every anesthesiologist, every nurse anesthetist. Desiree and I try to standardize it as much as possible to a merit-based uh, incentive. In incentive payment system, the MIPS measures that we report out for all of our cases. But we do also work with client sides to say, you know, is there an area that you would like to see improved either operationally or clinically? And how can we incentivize our anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists to be as good partners, kind of rowing all in the same direction as your yeah. employees as well? We, we do believe in carrots. <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> and, it, and it is interesting in this area, unlike I think other specialty areas, it's very hard to create an RVU based mm -hmm. equivalent because one, you know, anesthesia doesn't create volume. And two, depending on the hospital, you may be more or less efficient depending on what their volume looks like. So it's very hard to hold a clinician accountable for the value that they're creating, the revenue that they generate. The flip side is from a quality perspective, that is something that we can hold them accountable for. So in general, our incentive side of the clinical behavior is really much more quality focused than sort of profit focused. Yeah. Yeah. And I think really this, the scale going back to that and why, you know, why we can do that. We can um, provide resources and support for our clinicians when it comes to this, where, you know, smaller groups may not be able to do that. We really do focus on that and try yeah. and, and provide that for our clinicians. Um, so lots of benefits to a large anesthesia management company. There may be some challenges or maybe limitations of that. It's kind of the elephant in the room of, of some of the discussions that I've had lately is that, you know, there's a little bit of press about large companies and how that affects um, the healthcare system and, and what's happening. So you know, we've had a lot of conversations internally about that. You know, where, where do we fall on that? And what are your thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, I think there's sort of two big things to think about. I think one is, is private equity inherently evil, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which seems to be the, the theme of the day. On that side, I struggle with the fact that there's nothing that a lot of these private equity businesses are doing that is any different than private practices. Yeah. So, you know, we have a group, I'm, I'm in the DC area, it's a group of orthopedic uh, surgeons. It's a private practice group. Their entire strategy has been, let's all get together mm -hmm. and we'll negotiate as one big group so that we have, you know, big market share. And, monopoly pricing. Yes. Yeah, and the yep. insurers can't do anything about it. So I can ask Care First you know, which is the big Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan that is the dominant payer in that market that is more than 50% of the, pay, the commercial payments. And we can set an equal sit footing. And if my costs go up 20%, I can say, hey, you can either pay me 20% or I'm going to go out of network and charge you more. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is a private equity backed group or it's a group of people getting together, it's the same thing. They're trying to get some scale so that they can set an equal footing with a payer. So from that perspective, you know, hey, sometimes it's hard for these groups to get together. It's nice to have somebody who's got some deep pockets to do that. I think that's not a bad thing. I think where private equity has more of a challenge in this healthcare space is that they go into these spaces to make money and to do that relatively quickly. And I think that's where there sometimes is a disconnect, which is, you know, the time frame for most private equity is three years, and it may stretch to five. The vast majority of hospitals don't want to only work with a group for five years. They don't want, you know, anesthesiologists. I'm not sure I want to join a group and have it change every three years. So that's where we see a lot of disconnects. And I think where Northstar has a model is it's much more it's long-term capital. So the idea is 
similar to a Berkshire Hathaway, our investors that came in, the idea is that they'd like to never sell North Star. And when you have that longevity, it actually lines up much more with the, you know, hospitals don't want to switch their anesthesia group all the time. Anesthesiologists don't want to be parts of different groups all the time. So it just creates more consistency. And I think, you know, people are looking for stability right now. They're looking for consistency. And I think that gives us a little bit of an advantage over maybe traditional private equity. But I think a lot of the bad press, you know, I have a hard time with, hey, you know, who is the biggest employer of physicians mm -hmm. in the country? Well, it's not the VA. Um, it's not private equity. It's United Healthcare, which is a payer. So <laughs> nobody's talking about that. Um, <laughs> and that seems kind of a very different kind of issue. Um, yeah. And I don't know why that is not getting as much press as, say, private equity is right now. Yeah. Josh, what do you think that means? I mean, as a clinician, what does that mean to you? I mean, again, you know, we've had lots of conversations about this, but I think it's always important to bring it back, you know, to us that have to show up to work yeah. <laughs> every day. Like, what? how does that translate down? I mean, as we think about growing departments of anesthesia, what are we doing with IT to report out our quality metrics? We can talk about this. I, I'll, I'll also add to the word cloud on, <laughs> on AI machine learning. Like, uh, are there ways that as an organization, we're leveraging AI and machine learning to go through just a gazillion data points with all the, you know, 1.1 uh, million anesthetics that we do to help find you know, small tweaks that we can make to improve outcomes, to improve the type of work um, that we do. And, and then just from a, like being an employee standpoint, like, do I have a benefits team that's really taking good care of me? Do I feel good about the insurance that I'm getting? Do I feel good about the executive team and the operational support that I'm getting? All of that costs money. And all of that requires a long-term view to say, you know, the ROI on this is not going to be a year from now. It's not going to be 18 months from now. It may be five years from now, but this is what helps us a recruit people. This is what helps us report out quality metrics, which we inherently believe we're going to be asked to do. Maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow, but it's probably going to be three years from now. And that's why making that investment now is very important. That does not happen yeah. in a, or that potentially does not happen. It's not top of mind with a short-term, you know, private equity uh, mindset. It is inherently part of if, if we as an as an organization are going to exist and be vibrant 10 years from now these are the decisions that we need to be making yeah. and investing in now yeah sure. and, and wholly sold on the <clears throat> excuse me on the benefits of long-termism i mean does that extend to looking at your recruitment pipeline and maybe even supporting people i don't know through med school or through residency that kind of thing yeah so it, it is something that we've spent a lot of time on um at north star i think the two aspects of it are really about how do we create more students. Um, so uh, we are in process of starting three residency programs uh, uh, at facilities around the country uh, where we are sponsoring a lot of the uh, economics that go into that. You know, we're looking to expand residency programs where we have them um, for that reason, which is how do we create more anesthesiologists. On the anesthetist side, we're doing this, a similar thing around students. So uh, I think we've tripled the number of students that we have in our facilities. Those are not going to pay off now, um, but theoretically, you know, two, three years down the road, um, you're going to start to see those anesthetists actually graduate and be part of the programs. It's a big investment on the residency program, but, you know, five, six years from now, it should be really helping us overall. So I think those are some of the investments that we are making that, to your point, it, they, they will pay off over the long term, but it actually requires a fair amount of investment between now and then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the returns are going to greatly outweigh the expense today. So provided we have a place where we're going to be around uh, in 10 years, it makes a lot of sense to be doing that. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, switching gears just a little bit to maybe less doom and gloom on <laughs> some of the economic side of things. What are you most excited about? Josh, specifically in the quality space, so I get to ask this, um, about, uh, you know, what we're doing and where we're going with North Star and, you know, really working and partnering, collaborating with our, the physician and, and CRNAs? Yeah, I think, um, so, and number one, anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists want to feel as if their careers are continuing to grow. So, uh, within the quality space, we're creating pathways for leadership uh, amongst our anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists to say, we want you to be the director of clinical quality at your 
organization at your location, reporting out, you know, A, your quality metrics, near misses, participating in the QA, QI committee to make, you know, to make the whole system better. Um, Every year, I do say this, there will be a tipping point from payers um, in the near future. It is happening this year uh, with CMS, whereby our excellent outcomes are going to be rewarded. And unfortunately, on the other hand, either not reporting or your poor outcomes are going to result in the uh, the stick, <laughs> not the carrot. Uh, you're going to get you're going to pay a penalty to CMS, and that is going to also go to payers in the near future. We're not there yet. But that is, you know, on the cusp. And so, you know, having an infrastructure that, infrastructure that's all set up to say, you know, give us the green light. We are ready to report out on these quality metrics and really show all the good things we've been doing historically that we have not necessarily been rewarded with beyond just being able to say what we're contributing in terms of the clinical care of our patients is helping to reduce readmissions and complications and reduce length of stay. We will be we will reap rewards in terms of increased reimbursement from payers um, on the both the, the the private side as well as the uh, the government side. Yeah, that's great. And Adam, from your perspective, where do you see the next five years? So I think you know people say five to ten years. I mean, who knows ten years? But in the next you know three to five years, where do, what do you see the landscape? How is it going to be changing? Yeah, I mean, I for the big thing that I'm gonna that we're starting to see that I think is going to change. There's a supply and demand issue. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think there are a lot of things happening to supply. So I kid you not, there's tens and twenties of the number of SRNA programs that are launching. I think every SRNA program is expanding. You're seeing the same thing on the residency side. You're seeing AA schools start um, that hadn't been in place before. So I think you're seeing a lot of movement around supply. I think the bigger impact in the next three to five years is the demand side. I think hospitals are faced with increased costs and they are just going to have to rationalize uh, the surgical suites that they run. You are seeing it also on the ASC side, which is some of these ASCs that got that got launched are closing because yeah. they're not seeing the volume they need to be viable. That is going to dramatically reduce demand. And I think that's really what's going to start to create stability. So I think once the landscape starts to stabilize, then people can, it, it becomes less stressful for everyone. While there are lots of providers who think that, you know, being a locum is great, you know, nobody likes inconsistency of the teams that they're working That's with. That's right. And I think you see that from a quality perspective. You definitely see that from a cultural perspective. And I think when you get stability around teams, everybody's happier. And yeah. it becomes a much better job day to day. So I think you're going to see a lot of provider engagement go up. I think you've seen a lot of sort of doom and gloom about, hey, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. I'm hoping that as you start to see that stability, engagement starts to go up. And then for us, we can start to focus a little bit where Josh was going on career paths, mm -hmm. which is I think there's a lot of ways that, you know, we hear in our engagement surveys every year, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, I can't fulfill my career uh, objectives. And I think a lot of people start out, they're happy to be a clinical provider, but they may miss research. Um, they may want to get back into that. Uh, they may wish, miss, you know, spending some time in quality or want to get there. They may have aspirations towards leadership or ownership. And where we are going to be able to spend some time once things are a little bit more stable <laughs> is actually investing in those career paths for team members. And I think that's something that I'm really excited about over time. Yeah. Great opportunity. It is. And, you know, one of the one of the things that I, I, I'm most excited about, two things. One is um, the research arm uh, and really expanding in that. Yep. Um, as private practices, we've done a little bit. We, we talked here on Top Med Talk last year. We partnered with USAP and, and Rick Dutton uh, and published a study on the incidence of IOH in community-based practice, which I, I think is, is huge. I mean, to be yes. able to do that, not a lot of private practices can participate in that. So that is a big opportunity. Or, or are frankly, <laughs> at this point in the game, willing to share yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, their performance and, uh, and uh, you know, going, going with a glass half full analogy, the opportunities for yeah. improvement. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's something that's really said to, you know, a lot of our challenges in U.S. healthcare is around rural medicine. Yeah. So getting outside of the big academic downtown medical centers. And the problem with research is, all the research is done in the big That's right. sort of downtown medical centers. So unless the groups like us, USAP, are sharing some of that data and participating in the research, there's always going to be this void of 
We have a lot of information about, you know, what happens in Cleveland and in yeah. Baltimore. Uh, <laughs> but it is very hard to figure out what's happening in sort of the rural areas where we're seeing some real challenges uh, from a quality perspective. So I think that's an additional thing that we can bring to the table um, that without this kind of participation is going to be very hard to actually play out. Yeah. And I think what, um, you know, we have focused so much on that I, I that I absolutely love and all, everything we've been talking to attributes that is like really creating a culture um, in, in inclusivity and, you know, trying to bring everybody, you know, together and, and work in a, an environment that you want to go to work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, it, it, true. And, and to Adam's point, you know, the research that we're contributing, um, kind of, again, the, the comparison versus the academic environment. I mean, these are, you know, some of them are CRNA only cases. Some of them are, are physician only cases. Some of them are done in a mixed model. Some of them are done in a care team model. Like yeah. it is, it is truly what the vast majority of practices across yeah. the United States operate under, as opposed to, you know, sort of the, the typical, uh, academic arm, which is attending anesthesiologist supervising two, uh, residents, um, in a, you know, probably ASA three, ASA four yeah. case that, that might not be representative of the vast majority of cases that are done across the country. Yeah, for sure. Guys, thanks so much for sitting down um, and taking the time here. Asa, yeah. I know you're very busy, lots of meetings, all that good stuff. Um, but look forward to future conversations. And, um, and you know, I think it's great just to be able to have a chat about kind of where we are and, and where we're going. Um, and, been for, I've learned a lot. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Mike no, was like asking me all these questions. I'm like, why don't we, why don't we wait for Josh and Adam? <laughs> well, it, it, thanks for the invitation. It'd be great to have you. Yeah, yeah. All right. And thanks for listening to Top Men Talk. You know, you can always find us at topmentalk.com. All of our videos from the ASA will be on our YouTube channel. You can find them there. We'll be putting out the podcast over the next several months. Um, so you can check us out. We're on social media, Twitter. Oh, sorry. X, formerly known mm. as Twitter, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, Facebook, we are there. And once again, thank you to the ASA um, for all the support to be here at Anesthesiology 2023. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now <laughs>